Hello there. My name is Dr. Nidhi Gupta. I'm a consultant in acute and general medicine, and I'm going to go through how to examine the cardiovascular system. I'm ably helped today by Jui, who will be help, who'll be letting me examine him. So first of all, in terms of the cardiovascular examination, you may be asked to examine the heart or the whole system or the pulse. Essentially, this all means the same thing. It's about examining the whole system. So initially, when you first start, make sure you clean your hands with some alcohol gel. And introduce yourself to your patient and get permission to examine them. Hello there. Hi. Is it Jui? Yes, it is. Hello there. I'm Dr. Nidhi Gupta. Is it okay if I examine your heart today? Oh. Are you in any pain or discomfort? Uh, no. If you are at any point, please let me know. Sure. Next, you're going to stand back and have a look at the patient. There are lots of things you can see just by standing back. So you're looking for any evidence of cyanosis, um, a malar rash um, along the cheeks, which could indicate mitral stenosis, any visible carotid pulsations, and any scars on the chest. After this, you'll next go to the hands. And in the hands, you're looking for any evidence of splinter hemorrhages, from example, infective endocarditis, any clubbing from congenital heart disease, and if you turn the palms over, you're then looking for any signs of a hyperdynamic circulation that could be evidenced by uh, palmar erythema. The next step is to assess the radial pulse. Now, there are a few things you need to be looking for. You can assess pretty much the volume and the rate um, in the radial pulse. Whilst you probably won't be able to get an exact rate, you can work out if it's got a normal rate or if it's bradycardic below 50 beats per minute or if it's tachycardic at above 100 beats per minute. You're also getting an idea of whether it is regular or irregular. In addition, you need to check for radial radial delay. So you're checking the radial pulse in both arms and that's because that could be an evidence of some atheroma. Next, after assessing the radial pulse, and you're also looking, for example, if it's slow rising with aortic stenosis, you're then going to check for the collapsing pulse of aortic regurgitation. Make sure you ask the patient if they have any pain in their shoulder before you move their arm, and you're feeling for the pulse to collapse when you raise it above the cardiac line. Do you have any pain in your shoulder? Uh, no, I do not. Okay, I'm just going to raise your arm up. Don't help me. Yeah. After the brachial pulse, I would suggest assessing for radiofemoral delay, which will give indication of co-optation of the aorta. As I've been saying this, Julie has been known that I'm going to do this. However, if you're going to do this in an examination, make sure you warn the patient first. Next, you're going to go to the neck and assess for the jugular venous pressure. Now remember, this is the internal jugular vein, and you're going to have to position the patient correctly. Reclining at 45 degrees with the patient's head back and turned towards the left. There are a couple of things you're looking for when you have the patient in the position for the JVP. The first is, is it at the normal level or elevated? Um, the marker used is the sternal notch, and if it's elevated, it will be three centimeters and above the sternal notch. The second is that you will check the hepatic reflex, and this is when you press on the liver and you increase the venous return through the IVC and can cause the JVP to elevate as a result of that. We do, on the website at clinicalskillspro.com, have a full tutorial about all the different JVPs, how you can identify them, and understanding the pathology that goes with them. Now you're going to go to the chest. Before you auscultate, there are quite a few things you need to do. You've already stepped back and had a look, but now is your chance to have a second, closer look. The first thing you're looking for are scars. Is there a midline stenotomy scar from a coronary artery bypass graft? Is there a valvotomy scar beneath the left nipple from a mitral stenosis valvotomy? Is there a pacemaker scar? Or are there scars such as from respiratory procedures, such as thoracotomies? Having done this, you're next going to check for the apex beat. This is normally located in the fifth intercostal space, left side midclavicular line. And you're going to have a feel and check whether it's normal, thrusting or tapping in nature. 
I'm just going to feel with your chest now, okay? If you cannot feel the apex beat, make sure you go more laterally as if there is left ventricular hypertrophy and enlargement, this can displace the apex beat. Next, you're going to feel for heaves and thrills. Remember, for right ventricular heave, you're going to feel it on the left hand side. Now and only now are you going to auscultate the heart. Remember your four positions. Initially do the aortic, then the pulmonary, tricuspid, and mitral valves. Remember the aortic is the right midclavicular line, second intercostal space. Same on the other side for pulmonary, and the tricuspid space, which is the fourth intercostal space, and then mitral, the fifth. Notice how I had my fingers palpating the carotid pulse at the same time. This is so you can time the heart sound to the pulsation and you can make sure that you're getting the right order. Next, you're going to ask the patient to turn onto their left hand side. Now, these are for several reasons. The first is you want to see if the apex beat is displaced and becomes more palpable. Secondly, if the patient has a mitral stenosis, it can be heard more loudly. And you can also make sure that you use the bell rather than the diaphragm, as the bell allows lower pitch sounds to be heard better. Can you please turn over onto your left? Thank you. Just another few. Next, you're going to check for aortic regurgitation. You're going to ask the patient to sit forward and in expiration, you're going to listen for a diastolic murmur that can be slightly high pitched. Can you please sit forwards for me? Take a deep breath in and out and hold. Breathe normally. As you noticed, as the patient was sat forward, I had an opportunity to also listen to the carotids. Now, previously, we used to listen for carotid brewies. However, this has pre pretty much been debunked. It has no clinical value and has no correlation um, to ultrasounds of the carotids and indication of stenoses for stroke. And so I would not try and listen for them. 
The key thing to listen to, though, at the carotid is if you have found any evidence of aortic stenosis, if there is radiation to the carotid, this confirms that this, this is aortic stenosis. However, if there is no radiation, this is more of an indication of aortic sclerosis and hence is not pathological. And the carotids help to differentiate between these two. In addition, as the patient is sat forward, you can use this as an opportunity to listen to the base of the lungs. Now, there are a couple of things you're listening for. If there are any crackles indicating fluid overload and if it's normal. Also, if on auscultation of the heart, you heard a machinery type murmur, you can listen below the left um, uh, scapula for evidence of a patent ductus arteriosus. Can you please sit forwards? Big breaths in and out through your mouth, please. And again. And just breathe normally. Okay, stay sitting there, please. Whilst you're here, you can also feel in the sacrum for any evidence of edema. Finally, having checked the sacrum for any edema, you're now going to check the ankles. It's important to ask the patient if they've got any pain or, dis um, or discomfort in their legs, as if somebody has pitting edema, it can actually be very sensitive. Julie, do you have any pain or, dis or discomfort in your ankles? No, I do not. Okay, I'm just going to press lightly on them, okay? Sure. All that's left is to thank your patient for letting you examine them and then present your findings. Thank you very much. Thank you.